couple of weeks ago, at least I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about the tag Porsche engines that powered McLaren to a driver's and constructor's title in 1984 and 1985. And in the comments of that video, the memes began. But only because I'd started those memes. Now if you're new here, there's a bit of a running gag on the channel. Whenever there's a discussion about the turbos of the 1980s, we start taking the piss over the amount of power that they had, followed by the obligatory disclaimers. The figures will be initially, jokingly, exaggerated, because there have been claims from articles online and on YouTube videos exaggerating the figures for clickbait and not being totally clear with the purposes of those engines. 1400 horsepower is the general accepted amount for the BMW inline fours that Brabham and Benetton had, although the engines Brabham had would have been a tiny bit more powerful because they were BMW's official partners. But even then, this was only in qualifying. So it was no surprise then that somebody commented on that video saying that the inflation of the power figures isn't just a 1980s F1 turbo thing. It's been happening for Group A touring cars, Group B rally, Group C endurance and even the V10 era. Probably because people have got some warped idea of how those eras actually were to make them seem better than what we have now. Or it's Mandela effect. Or it's clickbait. It could be all three. People sharing examples of somebody trying to say that Group B cars had 1100 horsepower and so on. It's up there with these other myths like the Mazda 787B was so fast they banned it. No, they didn't. And if anybody tries to tell you that, they've been had. And someone tried to tell me before that this inflation stuff isn't happening. It is. So like I said, I don't know why it happens, but it does. You've got to get those clicks, I guess, and I'm sure most of us have actually seen it. And it's only natural that we're going to see it happen with the old V10s and stuff because those things were outlawed 20 years ago now. I mean, sort of. Toro Rosso was allowed to run a detuned V10 in 2006, much to the annoyance of the other back-of-the-grid teams. But actually, while we're on the subject, there was something else from around that time that I'm sure will end up being inflated a few years from now. Because when the 2006 season started with new engines, one of the most insane engines ever created came onto the grid. And it came from those boffins at Cosworth. You know what to say next. Okay then, say it with me. Cosa. And if you think the crying over the engines is a thing now, it was still a thing in 2006, when the engines were shrunk by 600cc and two cylinders were lopped off. As mentioned a few times now, it was all because Formula 1 needed to be seen to be doing the right thing. With the back of the grid in shambles with the departure of Minardi and Jordan, and Jordan as it so happens changed hands three times in as many years and was renamed three times in four, the FIA and Formula 1 needed some form of stability. The sport was just one economic disaster away from losing a huge chunk of the grid, so cost cutting had to happen, and they needed to look like they were trying to save the planet. So as it was, for 2006, the 3 liter V10s were done away with and in came the 2.4 liter V8s. Which sounds like an oddly specific number. 2.4? Why 2.4? Why not 2.5? It's because of... I don't know what you'd call it, I just call it the relative displacement or something along those lines. 8 tenths of 3 is 2.4. So if you cut off 2 cylinders from your 3 liter engine, you have a 2.4 liter V8. It's probably not called relative displacement, but I think you know what I mean. And people didn't particularly like the fact that F1 had gone this way, even in 2006. Thanks to the Autosport forums being one massive archive, I found some comments that were dunking on the new era before it had even begun. Because of how downforce heavy cars had become at this point, people were crying that the power levels had dropped to unacceptable levels, so that now the cars would be on rails, especially because they got traction control at this time. The cars weren't producing the 1000 plus horsepower levels they were in qualifying in the turbo era, so people were thinking that the cars were going to be slower than Champ Car. Some said, why just V8s? Why not let them run what they want so long as it's 2.4 litres? With somebody suggesting that Ferrari bring a V12 that went up to 22,000 RPM. But the thing is, all of this cost cutting had actually been going on before the V8 era came in. In the early 2000s, the rules were changed to be V10 only, this being when Toyota was developing a V12 for use in their debut season. If that V12 had worked, the other teams might have rushed to develop their own, spending a lot of money. And with the ban on beryllium pistons sending BMW, Mercedes, Ferrari, Ford and Honda on a mission to find the next lightweight wonder metal, it would have pushed costs up even further. It meant that the manufacturers didn't have to spend loads on developing something new and spend even more on trying different configurations. Somebody on the Autosport forums claimed that simulations were telling Ferrari that a W12 was the way forward. 
I'm calling BS on that. But the one thing that was true about all of this is that power levels and RPM had been slowly creeping up over the course of the 2000s. BMW is regarded to be the first to hit the 19,000 mark, doing so in 2002. In the mid to late 90s, around 16,000 or 17,000 was the general amount of revs that the engines could put out. And like mentioned, it started creeping up as the manufacturers dumped more and more and more money in to try and get more and more and more power with what they'd got. But then, in around 2003 or 2004, the mileage the engines had to do was increased, so rev limits began being put on to manage the life of the engine, and also help with fuel economy. Still, by the time the 2005 season ended, all of the engines were exceeding 900 horsepower. Toyota managed to get their engines up to 19,200 RPM, while Cosworth took a while to catch up. And speaking of Cosworth, for the 2006 season, they were trying to get more than they'd ever done before. The 2006 engine regulations didn't have any limits beyond the displacement and the bore. The maximum bore of the engines was just under 100mm, which allowed for about 40mm of stroke. That's 3.85 inches and 1.57 inches for those who insist on using old money. But overall, the amount of horsepower that was dropped from the engines was around 200, at least that's what the FIA claimed. So all of this was just like when the FIA starts lopping off downforce or banning aerodynamic parts. They have to find a way of getting back what they've lost. In an interview with Race Engine Technology, Cosworth's Bruce Woods said that the 3.0-litre CJ engine had a 95mm bore. To go faster, they had to make the bore bigger and the stroke shorter, and do some stuff with the valves. So they tried 96, 97 and 98mm bores on the V10s, with 98 working best. Then the V8s were announced and luckily 98mm was the maximum allowed. By 2005, Cosworth had worked out how to reduce the amount of friction caused by running a faster revving engine and they'd done this with some special coatings. Coatings developed while they were fiddling with a 3.0-litre V12 in the late 90s, an engine that had a rather optimistic redline. A redline they managed to carry over onto this 2.4-litre V8. 20,000 revolutions per minute. Something nobody had ever done before or since. Now, just as an aside here, finding an image of the actual engine has been... Well, difficult is an understatement, so this is more of a slap me on in the background while you have your lunch type of video. There was a picture of it on Getty Images, but at £250 and then the usage rights being a bit confusing, if not iffy, I'm just not doing it. I have found a picture of the engine if you really need to look at it, and I suppose I need to do the thumbnail as well, but, you know, Google also exists. But to be honest, the engine, it's... It's not that impressive you know, to look at. It's not like it's the Life W12 or whatever that Subaru thing was in that Colony in the 80s. But I'll figure it out. Anyway, on with the video. And revving the engines higher was the optimal way of recouping some of that 200 horsepower that had been lost due to the change in engine regulations. Cosworth used titanium alloys for the connecting rods and forged aluminium for the pistons. It made things lightweight and strong, but running it at high revs would start to damage the other parts of the engine. It also induced a thing called valve float, which is a suboptimal condition where the valves don't close fast enough due to the speed of the engine, and it can cause the valve to collide with a piston and destroy the engine. So, Cosworth stiffened the valve springs and tightened up the crankshaft. There was also a lot of friction being generated, which doesn't help things either, and that generates excess heat. But Cosworth seemed to get everything sorted out pretty easily, at least according to these reports that I've got here. The bore to stroke ratio was quite high, 2.47 to 1 according to the source I have here, but it could be slightly higher or slightly lower depending on where you find your data. Short strokes allow for higher engine speeds, which, in an F1 car, is exactly what you need. Now truth be told, I don't understand any of that, but it's data you might find interesting. And it put the engine power on par with the 3.5 litre V8 that was in Schumacher's Benetton in 1994. On top of this, the crank pins were less loaded up than on the 2005 engine, and all this, along with the increase in bore size, did give Cosworth some advantages. But the combustion still had to be consistent, and doing that at higher RPM was harder because of the larger bore, and as the stroke to bore ratio increased, it became harder and harder to get the same compression ratio, because the time for combustion shortens as the RPM goes up, or something along those lines. I'll leave a link to the article where I got all that data from in the description so you can read it at your leisure. Basically what I've done is I've cherry picked the easier to understand parts and then leave it so you can go and read more if you want to. But really Cosworth got around all of this 
stuff by running the fuel pressure at the highest allowed level, 100 bar. But even though Cosworth had years and years and years of experience of V8s, there were other problems creeping in. 200 bar of fuel pressure was being used in testing before the regulations limited them to the 100 bar already mentioned. But because they were running this engine so high on the RPM, the vibrations creeping in were unlike anything anybody had ever experienced before. V10s are a little more balanced than V8s, with V8s being okay vertically, but not horizontally. Cosworth reported that when they first took the engine to its highest levels, the bolts connecting the scavenge bolts to the sump snapped off. The new engine, dubbed the CA2006 rather than the TJ that was used the year before, was tested in the November of 2005, with the data showing that the Williams car it was fitted to was producing around 755 horsepower at 19,250 RPM. Not maxed out by any means, but it was running pretty damn high. It was comparable to the Mercedes engine in the McLaren MP421, with that producing 750 horsepower at 19k, but a little down on the Ferrari, which was 785 at 19k. Although, take those figures with grains of salt because this could be max power in qualifying and other bits and pieces. The engine was actually quite effective, but the Williams car didn't handle particularly well. It wasn't behaving itself on entry to the corners, and several potential great results were wasted particularly at Sepang, when the Cosworth engine blew up in Rosberg's car after starting third. Despite this though, there were flashes of promise, but these flashes came at circuits where engine power wasn't a defining factor, like at Australia and Monaco. But at those two races, Weber was actually on for a podium before his hydraulics went in Melbourne, and then his exhaust went haywire at Monaco. Rosberg though did set the fastest lap at Bahrain, showing that the engine did have a certain something. The way Cosworth was able to get to the 20k red line right from the start was because of how they designed the pistons. The other manufacturers had realised this as well, knowing that it was how loaded those 98mm pistons were going to be running that high, because now the engine pistons had to be an aluminium alloy to prevent the teams going for something similar to those beryllium pistons that McLaren had in the late 90s, these pistons that could potentially be toxic. As such, the other manufacturers simply didn't bother trying to engineer something that revved that high, what well, Cosworth did. But despite the fact that it revved to an ungodly 20,000 revolutions a minute, the engine was actually quite reliable. The blow up at Malaysia cost Williams some points, but the only other time that the engine blew up was at Germany, when Weber lost his engine. That's it. Although there could be an argument for the engine causing other problems, because Weber lost the transmission at Australia and Rosberg lost his drive shaft at Monza. Could those failures have been caused by the torque coming from the engine? Maybe, but I'm not an engineer. It wouldn't be the first time this has happened either, because when we get to part 3 of the McLaren Honda story, that engine was actually shaking itself apart from vibrations. But given all the other issues that Williams had that year, they only had 5 points paying finishes to show for it, taking them to a total of 11 for the 2006 season. This left them down in 8th place, which was their worst finish in Formula 1 since they began racing as Williams in 1978, excluding the Frank Williams racing cars days that then became Wolf. But, they did achieve some good qualifying positions, 3rd and 4th at Malaysia being the highlight but it seems, ironically, that the best qualifying sessions came at tracks where they didn't need the power. Weber 2nd in qualifying at Monaco and 5th at Hungary, but after that they slipped back in qualifying and the reliability wasn't helping them either. But after the 2006 season the FIA mandated a cap of 19,000 RPM for 2007 which became 18,000 in 2010. But Cosworth wasn't going to be around for 2007. Williams had swapped their engine supply to Toyota in a three-year deal and there were no takers for Cosworth at all that year. Toro Rosso had been running that detuned Cosworth V10 in 2006 but they then swapped to running Ferrari engines instead. So Cosworth went on a bit of a sabbatical from supplying engines to the rest of the grid, returning in 2010 because they'd become Bernie's off-the-shelf partners for that particular time period, so they could supply to the back of the grid teams and, well, anybody else that wanted Cosworths. Rebadged as the CA2010 rather than the 2006, the engine came into service powering the Williams, Lotus, HRT and Virgin cars, with only Williams scoring any points with that particular engine. As per the rules, the engine was limited to 18,000 RPM at all times, and in 2010 was run without a KERS system, this being because of a gentleman's agreement that was in place to not use KERS again until 2011. In 2012, that version of the engine was only seen in the Marussia and HRT cars, because Lotus slash Caterham had partnered with Renault, as had Williams. In 2013, HRT had disappeared, leaving just Marussia with that particular engine. In the period 2010-2013, to just 74 points were scored with this engine. 
all of them, with Williams. So competitively, it wasn't all that, but as a technical exercise, it remains to this day the highest revving engine ever seen in a Formula 1 car. And it only ran for one season. It was revving so high the F1 television broadcast had to add a couple of extra thousand RPM to that little graphic they had in the corner, you know, the one that showed revs, speed and throttle inputs. At the German Grand Prix weekend of 2006, Weber's Williams was seen creeping above that 20,000 mark, with Cosworth's own dyno showing a reading of 20,002. A record that's never been beaten, despite a couple of claims on the Autosport forums that Schumacher's Ferraris had been doing that in 2003 or 2004. Never happened. But the engineering behind this Cosworth engine is astounding. 20,000 RPM and it only blew up twice. That's... Well, that's incredible. But unfortunately, 20k would be the absolute limit, engineering-wise and through the rulebook. As already mentioned, the FIA clamped down on rev limits which made the Cosworth a one-of-a-kind engine. It also meant that Mercedes, Honda, Ferrari, BMW, Renault and Toyota weren't going to be spending money on doing the same thing, or even trying to go to 20,500 or even 21,000. But that said, getting an F1 engine to 21,000 is going to be very difficult, if not impossible. Heat, stresses, valve float, even with pneumatic valve springs, it's just not worth it. That's before you get into things like efficiently running the engines in the first place because you've got to mix the fuel and the air. And with the refueling ban coming in for 2010, teams wouldn't have been going to 20k in the races anyway. Qualifying they might, but engine mileage was getting stricter and stricter. Would it be worth it? Answers on a postcard. Now though, the rev limits have completely gone, although with these hybrids they are limiting them to around 12 and a half, 13. So the CA 2006 was a one-hit wonder, but even then, it didn't really have any hits. Its best result was sixth at the 2006 Bahrain Grand Prix with Mark Webber, although Rosberg was in seventh with the fastest lap. That's it. When it was reworked into the 2010 model, it got fourth at the European Grand Prix in the hands of Rubens Barrichello, but by that point, it was limited to 18,000 RPM and wasn't able to stretch like its big brother did. So because of the car it was mated to in 2006, it never achieved the same iconic status as its grandfather, the DFV. But with that said, it did show the lengths that the engine manufacturers were going to go to to gain back power that the FIA was lopping off during different regulation cycles. F1 engines had gone from 900 plus to 700 in the space of a few months, and if revving higher was going to get some of that back, then they were going to do it. If they could get it to work. And Cosworth did. It's just a shame that they peaked at that first race in Bahrain and then slipped further back as the season went on, with Webber leaving Williams at the end of 2006 to go and join Red Bull. Now though, with the 2026 season just around the corner and teams getting ready to launch their cars and go testing and do their shakedowns and everything else, and actually saying that, it's ironically 20 years after this engine was in service, there are different things surrounding the engines again. The teams are worried they're going to run out of electrical energy by the end of the lap, so a couple of the teams, most notably Mercedes and maybe Red Bull as well, have been exploiting something to do with the compression. If they can make more power in the engine, then they don't have to rely as much on the battery. And who says that innovation in F1 is dead? So then, a look at the Cosworth CA 2006 engine, the highest revving engine ever seen in Formula 1 before caps were put on the engines for costs, reliability and economy. If this has been an interesting look through the motorsport history books then do leave a like on this video so I know I did a good job and for more stuff from the channel get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on anything else that I do around here. Massive thanks as ever go out to the rad lads over at Patreon for the continued support and if you want to help with the picture purchases or otherwise keeping the lights on around here there'll be a link to Patreon down in the description along with links to Discord, socials, affiliates and any other bits and bobs you might want or need to know. Well, there's super thanks for one and done donations and memberships if you want to do Patreon style support, but without going to Patreon. So until next time, I've been Aidan Ward, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.